Hello, welcome or welcome back. Thanks for joining me today. That sounds so formal. We're not formal here, obviously, but it's time for another wrap up. So here is what I read in September. Not as much as I'd hoped, but more than I feared I may get to. So. so I started the month with One to Watch by Kate Stamen London. This has been getting a lot of attention online. I believe I've mentioned it before. It follows a plus size fashion blogger as she competes on a bachelor like reality show to find true love. And it's, yeah, it's been getting a lot of buzz. I will say that I think that my reading experience of this book was impacted by different expectations or going in with different expectations as a reader than what was the reality of the book. So the way I was seeing it talked about online, I thought it was a traditional romance and it was more chick lit. Now that sounds amorphous, right? But you go in with very different expectations as a reader in each genre. So for instance, in romance, you're gonna focus more heavily on the romance itself especially like in the plotting. And this focused more on our protagonist, but we had lots of men in play. We often didn't get to know them that deeply. One of my critiques is that some of these men could feel a little surface level or flat for my liking, especially when we were trying to overcome stereotypes with this book, right? We were trying to interrogate what we view from people and how we make make judgments based on physical appearance or one snap judgments, what have you. And I, it didn't feel like we really got to know everyone and a couple of the characters did feel a little bit thrown in. So that's not to say I still enjoy the book quite a lot. I wish we'd gotten to know our protagonist a little more deeply and holistically. I did love especially the family angle of it. Uh, her brothers play um, a trick on some of the men who are not so kind to her on the show later in the book and things like that. Those were really a joy, but I would have loved to kind of expand her beyond her, well, maybe like just her blog a little bit more. She was a very successful fashion blogger and we only got little bites of that. Like it was a, it was a given circumstance rather than something we really got to explore as a reader. Now, where the rom or the women's section comes into it was that there was a lot of, we had to read like kind of like outside perspectives of the show in real time. So we had blog articles for um, entertainment bloggers or my personal favorite, we had a slack from coworkers with a pool, like a bachelor style betting pool around the show and their conversations around the different episodes. So it was really a joy to get to read the outside world commentary on these real events. So I think in that way, the structure really worked. I think that just the idea of that competition show style, while really compelling, you do work at a disadvantage because you're throwing in lots of characters at once and they need to stand out in the same way that on the show people are trying to stand out. So that was kind of my one, like, I wish uh, we've gotten to know them a little deeper. And that's also, you know, where the romance, the difference between the two come in, because in a romance, you pretty much know who your hero and heroine are, who, you know, we're shipping together. And in this one, I I had my my finger on the pulse for most of the book, but but they did try and keep, or the author did try and keep us guessing, right? She didn't want it to be a complete given until it was a complete given. And there was a moment where you're like, okay, yes, this is the direction we're going. So it was a joy, but no, it's more women's fiction. And there are certain critiques, I think, that, that could be had around the book. For my Meg Cabot reference of the day, though, if you liked her 2000s series, not her, that's not the name of the series, but she had a series in the 2000s that was very centered on like internet culture and early internet culture. And it felt very similar throwback to that. And that was also kind of a, a women's fiction with a romance focus. Okay, the next book I want to talk about is Transcendent Kingdom by Yaa Jesse. This was a very anticipated read for me simply based on the author. I loved Homegoing. 
it was lyrical and beautiful and did such wonderful things with form and I was interested to see where Jessie was going to go next after such a standout debut and I was not disappointed. This book was very different than Homegoing and it was just still as lyrical and profound and transcendent to be a little too on the nose. So it follows our protagonist who is a scientist studying addiction basically and her mother is in a deep depression and she's kind of taking care of her. The form is much different than Homegoing, right? Because Homegoing is intergenerational, short, almost feels like short stories that are tied together. This one is focused on one family unit in particular and our protagonist and it goes in and out of flashbacks in a really gorgeous way that always keeps us moving. The, the modern timeline can almost be a little bit more reflective and the the flashbacks are where a lot of the action really feels like it's moving forward because it's exploring where we are in the present and why we feel kind of stuck in a way and we have to move out of that stasis. It explores the, the tension and the way religion and science can coexist and how we are seeking answers from both in similar ways. It's gorgeous. I really loved it. I think it explores so many topics in such a short little compact space and it does it with such compassion. And I don't know what other word to use there, but I think that that is really important. The next book I read was Gone with the Rogue by Amelia Gray, which was a traditional romance. It was a historical from a new author that I tried through the library. I'm gonna be honest, and this wasn't really a hit for me. It felt a little too surface level. We never really got messy with the characters' emotions, which is something I feel like I'm saying a lot, but it felt like the characters were kind of put on this pedestal. I didn't really feel the tension, the sexual tension between them. I kind of had to take it on faith that they were attracted to each other and some of that may be that it was it was a more cut to black clean romance so if you're looking for something like that that may be up your alley i but i don't know i haven't read enough recently where they're a little cleaner it doesn't it's not religious necessarily so if you're looking for something that's cleaner but not necessarily like christian romance this may work i will say that it did this thing that i don't love and it's a real fine line of when it works and when it doesn't in that the protagonist or our heroine had a charity that she ran, helped run, helped fund. And I noticed that sometimes these are done really well. Uh, Joanna Shoup and Sarah McLean are two examples that come to mind off the top of my head where, I don't know if Sarah McLean actually, but it feels on tangential where characters can have the oh the maiden lane series maybe regardless can have this interest in social justice or doing good works and it's a part of their character and it's something they're fighting for but it also isn't like this stand-in to kind of show oh look they're a good person it, it's more complicated than that and here it feels like oh we're supposed to know that she's a good person because of this and it almost feels then like people are being used as props. So I love protagonists that want to do good works, but I don't love when it feels performative. So take with that what you will, I guess. She's not a bad person. It just feels a little icky sometimes. Next was Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. This has been getting lots of buzz. I will say I was really bummed that this didn't make it from the National Book Award long list to the short list that was just announced. I think that this was absolutely stellar. It takes a look at race in America through the lens of caste, particularly comparing it to the traditional or more, more traditionally thought of Indian caste system and Nazi Germany. And it does this in ways that are really smart. She is able to approach this from a social science angle, from a journalistic angle. She's able to pepper in just enough of the personal without it feeling, I, I don't wanna say that the personal isn't necessary because the personal is some of my favorite in this, 
but it doesn't feel like a personal narrative. And I mean, that's why she's a, she's a professional, right? So she's a professional journalist. She knows what she's doing, but just the, the real skillful balance of all of those things, the social science, the journalism, the personal just made this an incredibly deep and impactful read. I think it's an important read for 2020. It exposed horrors I knew about, but it also exposed horrors I maybe didn't or didn't know the depth of, uh, particularly around lynchings, there were some really disturbing imagery um, in how people, white people, reacted and reveled in that practice. And that's something that's important to know and to have to sit with. Um, I think this book, it, it also does a great job at not being overly tied to the current political moment, but acknowledging how the current political moment is involved in these conversations and important to these conversations. Next is Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas. I've already talked about this one in a Future Friday. I still love it. I still think it's an utter delight. Since doing my Future Friday, I received my pre-order, uh, thing what I what I got for pre-ordering and it, it's these beautiful cards and just the way they the illustrations are just great and so I wanted I don't they didn't list the artist in the package that I got but I really love them so this book is still a joy and hopefully these these cards help you picture things a little better, but I really loved them and I wanted to share those because they brought a smile to my face. I, when I did the pre-order, I really just wanted the, the signed plate. I'm not usually like big on like tchotchkes um, and I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with these. I might use them as bookmarks, but I really just, I loved the art so much more than I was anticipating because I wasn't sure what to expect. And it was, it was a nice little bright, day in my mailbox when those showed up. So still, you know, a great book. A Chain of Gold by Cassandra Clare. So this one picks up with Will and Tessa and follows their children. So it's long. I guess to preface, first of all, I'm not one of those people that are like, why is Cassandra Clare still writing books? I realize there's a lot of controversy around her as a creator. I've been reading the books since I was a teenager. The world is like a comfort read to me, even if Magnus and Alex make me feel old with their domesticity. But, you know, I, I remember reading City of Bones and like throwing the book across the computer room when I got to the twist at the end. Um, so this is, this is a world I go back to. And also like I, as I've said, I grew up in the 2000s. This idea of like trilogies is kind of new. Er, I mean, fantasy, especially like fantasy with urban fantasy or fantasy with like a romance band, these series can run as long as they want to. Like Anita Blake has been around for a hundred years, it feels like. That one, I don't know, is that one over? So I don't, I'm not tied to this, like, why is she still writing? People are still interested in the world. She's still interested in exploring it. Okay. My critique is, I think the editors are now like they know she's gonna make the money. I feel like they're not editing her as heavily in terms of tightening up these books. I understand that especially these first ones were laying a lot of groundwork for the trilogy, but I have the same critique with Lady Midnight in particular. It just felt unnecessarily long and it felt like just bloated. Like I was like, okay, is all of this necessary? So I just wish that had been dialed in just a little bit. I'm still getting a feel for the characters, like they're fine. I think, I mean, there's some heavy like literary illusion like references in here. You've got your Oscar Wilde character and then there's a really heavy Great Expectations parallel, which like, sure, one, these are books that teens may be reading. So there might be, they are like potentially able to pick up on these parallels. Otherwise they're potentially exposed to these books through this book. 
in the same way that like Twilight exposed a lot of teens to like Wuthering Heights and what have you. So that doesn't bother me. I just don't really like it Great Expectations. I like Dickens. I have a beautiful copy of Great Expectations that I bought after working on a stage show because I feel like I earned it. But I just, I don't like Havisham. I don't like Estella. Like, and we have like a, those are the characters we're getting, right? We're getting Estella and Havisham. And I understand that Havisham is the, the imagery that people recognize and cling to and are interested in. I just, and it's not her, I, I just really don't like the Estella character. I feel like she's a little more complicated, especially at the end, but like, so that's all personal preference, right? Like that's purely how I'm responding as a reader to these very specific characters and very specific, you know, images and parallels that are being written into the books. There's a lot that I'm intrigued by and will like circle back to, but for now, we'll see. I just think it was a little too long. I love Creekwood by Becky Albertalli. Bertelli? I'm so sorry, Becky. Um, it's like a Simon verse novella. <laughs> it follows Simon and Bram as well as Leah and um, Abby. It's all told through letters and e or emails, I think. I don't think they do any texts. So it's kind of a return and a nod to Simon versus the Homo sapiens agenda. It also gets a nice little nod to the movie. So it, I, there's like a fair that comes back into play. And I think they reference the original Tilt-A-Whirl from the book, but they also managed to get in a Ferris wheel for those who discovered this world through the movie, which I thought was really nice. It also gets a reference to the American Girl <laughs> um, doll store prom dinner, which is one of my favorite moments <laughs> in the series. But uh, overall, it was it was a comfort read. It was and it was a joy to read, but it also made me feel like really old. You know, that transition from high school to college is a hard one. And finding out who you are, who you want to be and who you want to be with. So the next book is Fence by Sarah Rhys Brennan. Sorry, Fence Striking Distance by Sarah Rhys Brennan which is based on the comic series created by C.S. Packett, C.S. Packett, I should have looked that up, um, and Joanna the Mad. So this follows Aiden, Harvard, Nick, and Seiji, and the whole crew as they basically directly following the last match we got to see in the comics. So they're focused on team building in here. And as we know, we've got kind of a mo uh, motley crew that's not really gelling as a team yet. So amidst all of that, we also have, you know, our potential flirtations brewing. So I think it's really interesting because this series, while it's a slow burn on all accounts, really gives us the two main tropes that, that I think people really are drawn to, which is the friends to lovers and enemies to lovers. And it really has the banter. This book makes it really clear how socially awkward all of all of these gentlemen are. I mean, even Aiden, who's very, you know, popular, is, you know, special in his own way. And there's a really funny running gag where in the comics we know that Nicholas is able to beat Aiden because Aiden isn't able to get into his head. And within the books we see that Nick just like it all just goes away like Aiden starts talking and he cannot hear him we get to see more of Eugene we learn that he's a lifting bro we get to see that Dante just kind of puts up with the fencers for Bobby <laughs> and then we get these really delightful um, illustrations in the book that are scenes so here we have Seji attempting to bite some marshmallows out of Nicholas's mouth as he's trying to like stuff them all in. Um, there's a whole plot with a watch that's really delightful. In the front and papers you see uh, Nick running with a stake around his neck for very specific reasons. So it was just fun. This was my break the glass in case of emergency book for when I needed a pick me up and when stress was getting too much and I absolutely used it for that. It absolutely served in that capacity. I love that it is a paperback original. 
because I think that that makes sense. It, it more closely matches the price point the comics are at, maybe even a little cheaper, or the graphic novels, I should say. And I think, you know, I grew up with a lot of straight to paperback YA series, and I haven't seen them as much recently. So I'm, so I'm excited to see maybe, you know, a publisher like testing that format out again within novels. So I am excited and I, you know, I bought my copy. So I hope that we continue to see more from these boys because the burn is still slow and the burn is real. And also like with Nicholas's secrets and I just have to know. So we'll see what uh, the future brings there. Next, um, A Song Below Water by Bethany Morrow. This was really hyped got great reviews when it came out. I had started it on audio when it came out. And for some reason with the way I am currently listening to audio, because I'm not getting as much focus or as much audio time as I used to, I was having trouble with the two narrators and I wanted to be able to like really sit with both of them and figure out, you know, where we were as we were being introduced to the world. So I got on a library hold list as well so I could kind of pair those together is a twistish at the end. I consider myself a pretty astute reader and I'm usually pretty good at picking up on, you know, a twist or what have you. And so we were kind of left wondering about one of the characters till the end because there's supernatural elements in play. And I didn't catch on like to where Mora was leading us until right before the reveal. And that just shows how smart she is <laughs> because all of the pieces were laid and I just didn't see them until they were like right in front of my face. So it was a real delight. The sister relationship between our two protagonists was just beautiful, just is so complex and nuanced while also building such a beautiful young adult story and such lovely characters and there's a gargoyle that hangs out on the house and it's just I really liked it. They're looking for something with real strong supernatural elements, excellent character relationships and friendships and sisterhood, uh, some real strong social justice statements and, and statements about the world around us within the world of the book and maybe a little renaissance fair action this is a hundred percent a book for you I, I really think everyone should read it it was it was really gorgeous speaking of renaissance fairs i read well played by jen deluca which is the sequel to well met this follows stacy the fellow winch from book one and it's a cyrano inspired romance so if you suffer from secondhand embarrassment like me, know that going in, I, it could be hard as a reader because our hero and heroine are apart for most of the book and it's told through like text and email. And then when we do get them together, a lot of what they have to overcome is misunderstandings. So that is can be difficult. I think that the author does it well, but it is hard because we don't really get all of their romantic tension is through text and they're not really seeing each other face to face and playing out those feelings until later. And then it doesn't feel like we've totally grappled with that and really gotten to see if they, how they work together. I also would have loved to see more of Stacy's life because we, we get to see her basically an entire year before from fair to fair and we get to see her life but also like I, so much of this book revolves around Stacy feeling trapped in this small town and how she was going to get out and her mother got sick and she had to stay to help take care of her mother and I love how this series both the first one and this one portray small towns because it feels very real the first one, you know, you had Simon and this idea that you never trying to escape who you were in high school, surrounded by people you grew up with. And with Stacy, you kind of have some how you escape who you were in high school when you're when you feel that you haven't lived up to your potential or what you wanted your potential to be. 
And then in the, where I see kind of a third one going, we have someone that's very happy and excited to still be in the, in the hometown and, and living out their dreams. So it's just, I think, a really well-balanced take. And it feels like home. These aren't set, you know, where I grew up, but they feel similar, if slightly bigger, because we never had a bookstore. But yeah, so I would have loved to see her a little bit more in the book club. Or, But I think that part of it, too, was that she was, she was removed from those things. She felt separated. So there's a lot at play there, but I would have loved to delve even a little in a little deeper into that and into our hero. I feel like we got kind of a surface view of him in many ways, especially because so much of what we were learning about him was predicated on this lie. So even though we learned these truths about him, they, they stemmed from untruths. We did get to see more of the fair though, and an even bigger fair. Okay, next was The Deep by River Solomon. This was utterly gorgeous. This is a novella. I finished this and immediately wished I was in a lit class, particularly a feminist lit class, because it's doing so much in so little space. It is set underwater within a community. So it's, it's based on a song called The Deep. So I went and listened to that after. I actually hadn't heard it but it's this community of presumably mermaid-like creatures that are descended from slave women who were thrown over um, in passage, pregnant women. So it follows our protagonist who is the memory keeper of this community because these memories otherwise would be too much. So once a year they kind of get together and the memory keeper kind of guides them through these memories, but our protagonist is feeling the weight of these memories. So the way it plays with memory and the fact that we're underwater does really interesting things for the structure of this book, right? Like we've got these, we've got already waves built in within the water, we've got waves of memory and how this can play out structurally in the book. I was kind of letting it wash over me while reading it more than analyzing it. So I would like to study it a little deeper within those contexts because I think it writes from a very feminist perspective in that the structure doesn't feel Aristotelian, right? It doesn't feel like that natural climactic structure that we're so used to. So if while reading this, you're uncomfortable by that, just know that that is very purposeful. At least that's how I'm reading it. And I can't imagine that it wasn't. This writer is very intelligent. I read their other work, An Unkindness of Ghosts, earlier this year, and it was phenomenal. So I know that they are being intentional with their language and their choices. And especially in a novella like this, nothing is by accident. This was very skillfully done. It was, it was great. Lastly, we have The Unidentified by Colin Dickey. I did this on audio. Uh, Colin Dickey is the author of Ghostland, which takes a look at ghost stories in America and from like a social science angle. So this takes a look at urban legends, aliens, what have you from a social science angle. I think it does touch on you know some of the legends we know from across from other countries a little bit but it's more focused on america again and i am fascinated by this kind of social science through the lens of the weird what this myth making means for us as a country what it says about us what stories are and narratives are we crafting for ourselves and why what do those stories mean it in the alien section, he explores this idea that people are looking for answers for why they're exhausted, why they're tired in ways that they don't feel are being addressed by their doctors. So when they go, you know, deep dive on the internet and they're like, well, maybe you're being abducted, maybe you've been abducted by aliens. There is this inherent want to find an answer to these things that don't make sense. And how do those answers what do those answers say? So he doesn't necessarily answer questions as much as pose them, but I'm fascinated by taking a look at these things from a social science angle. And I think that he does that very well. 
if you enjoyed the podcast, the last podcast on the left, I think that this would be an excellent way to get similar content that you can count toward your reading, reading year. And I would be really interested to see someone pick up his work for a television show, kind of like a, a tour across America and these towns and these places and what stories we're telling and what those mean. And I think you could do like a stop per story kind of thing. I, I think that that would be interesting. So if anyone wants to steal that idea and run with it, they can make it happen. Free idea. So if you like that similar kind of unknown, it's also a great October, would be a great October nonfiction pick because it is the, the unknown, the unexplainable. You've got your Bigfoot and your, you know, lake monsters and aliens. So all of that is at play here. So I babbled on a lot. That is it for September. I've already got an exciting start to October. So I look forward to sharing that with you. In the meantime, what did you read in September? What did you really enjoy? Let's talk about it. So thanks for joining me and I will see you next time.